Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about ionizing radiation and their potential impact as a type of physical hazard in the workplace. I will go over three main topics, a brief overview of the electromagnetic spectrum, in particular ionizing radiation, how we determine radiation dose, potential health effects of radiation, and current dose limits, and the types of controls that should be in place to minimize exposure. So what do we think of when we hear the word radiation? I think the first things that come to mind are images of the atomic bomb blasts of World War II and Chernobyl. However, radiation is very much part of our personal lives and in the workplace. Whether we encounter it as radio waves from our radio, the cosmic radiation from the sun, to the x-ray radiation when you go get medical imaging. All these types of radiation form what is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Radiation is the transmission of energy given off by matter in the form of waves or particles through a space. How they are classified depends on the amount of energy, wavelength and frequency. The set of radiation types that we are most interested in in regards to workplace exposures are known as ionizing radiation and includes alpha and beta particles and gamma and x-rays. Ionizing radiation is the type of radiation which has enough energy that during an interaction with an atom, an electron can be removed from its orbit leading to the atom being charged. X and gamma rays, which have shorter wavelengths and higher frequency waves, have more energy and heat than radio waves which are longer in wavelength and lower frequency waves. The ability of radiation to cause its effects on human tissues are dependent on a number of factors, namely the amount of energy absorbed by tissues, the type of radiation, and the tissue type. The absorbed dose is the amount of radiation received in a material when it is hit by radiation. This is measured as energy absorbed per unit mass, and the unit of absorbed dose is called the gray. The absorbed dose, however, needs to take into account the type of particle that is giving off this energy, and this is called the equivalent dose. This uses a weighting factor which represents the biological effectiveness of that type of radiation in inducing health effects. For beta particles, this weighting is 1 whereas alpha particles, the weighting is 20. This is measured in millisieverts. Finally, you need to take into account the sensitivities of different tissue types in terms of the biological impact that can result from receiving this radiation, which is expressed as the effective dose. We use a tissue weighting factor for various tissue types. So for bone marrow and lung, the weighting is 0.12 whereas for thyroid, it's 0.04. If the whole body is the subject of radiation, then the weighting is 1. To summarize, in order to determine the amount of radiation that is received for a particular source to a particular tissue type, we calculate the effective dose, which is effective dose equals the absorbed dose multiplied by the particle weighting factor multiplied by the tissue weighting factor. It is important to understand that everyone is exposed to a low level of natural radiation as a part of life. In Australia, the total natural radiation is around 1.5 millisieverts. The Earth is constantly bathed in cosmic rays from solar flares and sunspots. The dose rate can also increase with height above sea level, as well as latitude with increased distance from the equator. There can also be natural radioactivity from rocks and soil. Certain occupations have higher levels of exposure to ionizing radiation. This may include the airline industry. Airplane pilots receive elevated doses above the normal background levels, but no statistically significant health effects have been observed. Exposures can also be seen in those working in the medical imaging industry, such as radiographers. Laboratory staff that conduct experiments using radioactive materials can also have high exposures. In terms of health effects, receiving a high dose of ionizing radiation in a short period of time, typically more than 500 millisieverts, can cause harmful tissue reactions, such as skin burns, sterility, 
cancer, acute radiation syndrome, and death. Unfortunately, this has been well documented from case studies of victims from the events of the atomic bomb blasts as well as Chernobyl. Chronic low-level exposures are less extensively studied compared to high exposure, and this is because of the latency period of many years before illness or injury. Studies, however, have indicated that the likelihood of cancer is dose-related, and it is cumulative over time. Famously, Marie Curie, the Nobel Prize-winning chemist and physicist who was known for her work on radioactive isotopes and x-rays, died of aplastic anemia, a cancer of blood cells, likely due to prolonged exposure to ionizing radiation, which was not known at the time. The International Commission on Radiological Protection recommends effective dose limits in order to minimize the harmful effects of ionizing radiation. For members of the public, this is 1 millisieverts in a year. High values can also be permitted if the average over 5 years is not above 1 millisieverts per year. For workers with occupational exposures, this is 20 millisieverts per year, average over 5 calendar years, or 15 millisieverts in one single year. There are also equivalent occupational dose limits for the eye, so 20 millisieverts in a year, skin, which is 500 millisieverts in a year, and hands and feet, which is 500 millisieverts in a year. In terms of developing controls for ionizing radiation, there are three main groups that we are concerned about. These are occupational radiation exposure. This could be in any industry where workers are at higher risk than background. Medical radiation exposure. This is both for operators such as the radiographer, as well as the patient receiving the radiation for medical imaging purposes. And finally, the public radiation exposure. The Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, which is the lead government agency in Australia, also has recommendations to consider in the use of radiation, namely justification, whether there's a net benefit for the use of radiation, optimization, which aims for the lowest dose required for a task in order to reduce radiation risk, and limitation, placing limits so that the dose which is considered unacceptable in terms of risk, are not exceeded. In order to limit exposure to radiation, three major factors need to be taken into account, namely time, the amount of exposure related to the time someone spends close to a source, distance, the amount of exposure reduces with the distance away from the source. With doubling of distance, you reduce the exposure by a factor of four. And shielding, the greater the amount of shielding, the smaller the exposure. So for alpha particles, they can't penetrate light material such as paper, so this can provide adequate shielding. For beta particles, heavy clothing is necessary to protect against beta particles. And gamma and x-rays, where thick dense shielding such as lead and concrete is necessary to protect against gamma rays. So if we incorporate this into the hierarchy of control model, for elimination, if the exposure to radiation cannot be justified, then it should not occur and be eliminated from the work process. For substitution, alternatives should be used as much as possible. Otherwise, the use of radiation should be optimized or limited, as was mentioned previously. For engineering controls, this revolves around shielding, and this incorporates factors such as workplace design in order to segregate or increase distance between areas where radiation is used from other areas in the workplace as well as physical barriers, such as lead barriers or high-density concrete in walls, ceilings, and floors. For administration controls, this involves minimizing the time that any one worker is exposed to radiation and the modification of the schedule to rotate workers so that exposure is shared. And finally, PPE. This involves personal shielding, which may involve the whole body, or specific areas of the body, such as the thyroid or reproductive organs. So in summary, we went over a brief overview of ionizing radiation. We also talked about radiation dose and potential health effects. And finally, we discussed the types of controls that should be in place to minimize exposure.
I think the central message is that we encounter radiation in our day-to-day -day lives, whether this is our personal lives or in the workplace. Having a fundamental understanding of its properties and how we are able to effectively control its use allows us to mitigate the risk of its effects they may have on both the short and long term.